recording. I think we've started now. So um, tonight we have Steve White, and he's going to talk on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And um, so just to read the promo in the email, um, the territorial dispute between Palestinians and Israelis has resulted in ongoing conflict since World War II. Uh, the territory in dispute is situated in what is termed the Holy Land, and in particular around the one city that all uh, three major monotheistic faiths, which is Judaism, Christianity and Islam, hold in high regard as a place for pilgrimage and worship. Uh, the claims to birthright to this land go back to Abraham Ham and his first two sons. According to the Bible, Ishmael is the ancestor of the Arabs and Isaac is the chosen heir to God's covenant with Abraham. However, in uh, the very dark days of World War I, Britain made agreements with both the Arabs and the Jews regarding the land, then known as Palestine, to seek short-term assistance to win the Great War. As an inevitable consequence, both Arabs and Jews believed they had received a promise that they would possess that land but the contradictory promises resulted in growing anger and conflict between Arabs and Jews in that land. By 1947, Britain, so weary after World War II, had had enough of this conflict. And on the 29th of 1947, the United Nations agreed to partition Palestine into a Jewish and Arab state. And this conflict has been going on ever since. So tonight, uh, Steve White is going to address the following issues. What has happened? What were the causes? Is anyone right or wrong? How should we view it? What has God got to do with it? So at this point, I'll hand it over to Steve. So thank you very much, Steve. Oh, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. And uh, because of you read the introduction, I don't really know, need to re-explain the significance of that image I put up there. Uh, this was a photograph taken um, in Passover in 2013, obviously a very significant time for the Jewish folks gathered there uh, underneath the Western Wall, but of course, looming over the top, there's the Dome of the Rock and of course, a, a minaret there as well. So that uh, places the uh, context of uh, probably the most uh, iconic part of what this conflict's about. So this is what I plan to speak on. Who are the Palestinians? Who are the Israelis? I'll look at Babylonian Roman conquest of the land. We'll then go back a bit further and look at Ishmael and Isaac. We'll look at Gideon's battle, uh, the Islamic conquest of Palestine, the Balfour Declaration and the UK mandate. And we'll look at 1948 when the partition happened, 1967 war uh, where Israel seizes the West Bank, uh, 1978 through 82, Operation Peace for Galilee, 87 through 93, the first intifada, and then 2005 to through five, the second intifada, and finally the Gaza wars, the ongoing wars. Now, uh, because even so, I'm probably gonna go over the normal a lot of the hour, I had to eliminate some of the conflicts that are going on. And the ones I've chosen not addressed are the 56 Suez Sinai crisis, because uh, there were some reports, but uh, fairly vague reports that uh, Israelis managed uh, massacred some Palestinians at that stage, but uh, I don't think it was that significant in terms of the overall picture. 73 Yom Kippur War was largely Egyptian and Syrian attempts to recapture the Sinai and Golan Heights. 91 Gulf War was largely Iraq versus Israel with a Scud bombardment um, in retaliation for allied efforts to evict Iraq from Kuwait. Uh, just a small side comment though, the Palestinians supported Iraq, so Kuwait expelled them. And then I won't address the 2006 Lebanese war, which was largely Hezbollah versus Israel. So who are the Palestinians? And I'm taking this from Wikipedia. Yes, I know it's not the most reliable organization, but it does give a crowdfunded view of what's happening. Um, and it does, in fact, this particular um, source had other cross references to more authoritative uh, uh, sources, but uh, this is the main quote, inhabitants of Palestine, uh, the Palestinians are inhabitants of Palestine for more than 1300 years, who today are largely culturally and linguistically Arab. 
Some have claimed descent from the original population of the territory prior to the Islamic conquest. Uh, and yet others, uh, particularly those in the, in the uh, villages out in the countryside, generally trace their family, that is the Hamullah's origin, to the Arabian Peninsula and its clans. The identity as a Palestinian, or in Arabic, a Philistine, and certainly uh, as English speakers recognise uh, the derivation of that particular term, arose only about 100 years ago, both in resentment to Jewish immigration to their land and indeed the general Arab nationalism also seen by um, Lawrence of Arabia, the character that most of us with an English background would know. Prior to that, they considered themselves part of the largest Syrian region of whichever Islamic caliphate was in power. Of course, we know of the Ottoman Empire, the last caliphate, uh, many significance, but there were others before. There was the Mamelukes, largely out of Egypt, and then there was another group that I can't really pronounce, um, who I think were based in Damascus. So there were various stages of different um, power uh, centres for Islam, and uh, all during that time, uh, the inhabitants of that time consider them part of that particular caliphate. So who are the Israelis? Well, in modern terms, the Jews who arrived in Palestine from Europe, that is the Ashkenazi Jews, or Islamic countries in the last approximately 130 years. Having said that, other Jews had lived in Jerusalem's Jewish quarter and other cities such as Safet for centuries. So there was a Jewish presence in the general region, uh, albeit very limited after the number of conquests. They faced extensive persecution in Europe. The Inquisition, Russian pogroms, which uh, largely we explain it, is, but those who may not understand pogroms, they're largely ethnic cleansing carried out by Tsarist Russia. And of course, uh, last but definitely not least, the Holocaust. And also a reminder, there was persecution in Arab countries, particularly after the Balfour Declaration. Let's touch on the historic uh, of modern Israel movement, the non Zionist movement. In 1895, Theodor Herzl from Vienna, a fairly well off Jewish man who lived in an assimilated uh, European country from, from uh, Vienna, founded the Zionist movement due to a growing anti Semitism in Europe, supposedly after he heard the crowd chanting, Kill the Jew, during the Dreyfus affair in Paris. Uh, again, just in case people don't know who the, what that was, um, in 1870, uh, the Prussians defeated the French in, uh, and took over France. Um, the French, who had a high opinion of themselves following Napoleon, were really devastated. And so they sought to rebuild their military so they could get revenge on the Prussians. Uh, but in about that time, 1894, I think it might have been, uh, they planted a spy in the, or the, what was then the German embassy, and they, the spy picked up the fact that the Germans had got hold of some military secrets from the French, and they looked around who the traitor was and immediately jumped on this, uh, the, the Jew, because he was a convenient scapegoat, as often they have proved during history. And so he was about to be sent to Devil's Island out in the Caribbean, uh, in a, a terrible uh, place to go. And then it started to leak that it was actually a uh, very much a setup, and then in fact it was someone else who did it. But because of the very, uh, I'm going to be honest here, the the Catholic, very conservative group in the army, they would have nothing to admit they'd actually chosen a scapegoat. And so there was quite a controversy in uh, France at the time, and that's when Theodore Herzl came and, and heard the crowd chanting "Kill the Jew," but on the other hand. Others were trying to get him free, and indeed he was free. So in 1896, Herzl wrote Der Judenstadt, the State of the Jews. The book argued the Jewish people should leave Europe for Palestine, their historic homeland. Only through a Jewish state could they avoid anti-Semitism, express their culture freely, and practice their religion without hindrance. Now, to be fair, Zionists were not really religious, and many adopted Marxist methods in Israel, such as, collect, uh, such as collectives, the kibbutz, for instance, uh, so, um, as we've heard, uh, they, they are very much, and I, I too much here because I've got an expert looking in, but I, as I believe it, everyone owns everything in common. There's nothing you possess for yourself, perhaps except for your clothes. 
Now, let's go back a while. Let's go back into history to find out why the Jews were still in Europe and, and others scattered around the world. And the King Nebuchadnezzar, some, this goes back to 600 uh, uh, BC, 2,600 years ago, some 40,000 Jews were exiled to Mesopotamia, that's Iraq and that area, from their land uh, during 605, 586 BC, and their temple was destroyed. Some returned under the Persian King Cyrus, but others remained in Iraq, where they largely prospered until those pogroms, the, when I, with that ethnic cleansing, forced them out after Israeli independence in 48. Under Vespasian and his son Titus, both Roman emperors, in turn, the Jewish temple was again destroyed in 70 AD, and many fled from Judea, to, largely to Parthia, which is now Iraq, which is not under Roman rule. Others fled to Persia, and some are still there. Under the Roman Emperor Hadrian, Jews had rebelled again in 132 AD and 580,000 were killed and many enslaved. He banished Jews from around Jerusalem and renamed the land Syria, Palestina. That's where we get the term Palestinian from. He was trying to revert from the previous province name, which was Judea. Some survivors settled in Galilee and Jews could only visit Jerusalem on the ninth day of Ab, the one day when two great uh, destructions befell the Jews, the destruction of Solomon's temple by Nebuchadnezzar and Herod's temple under Titus. Now, that's rubbing your nose in it, isn't it? The only time you could visit your most holy place is to remember the destruction of your temple. Through to the Byzantine era, Christian Arabs moved into Palestinian. And indeed, they subsequently fought against the Islamic armies later. And we'll get to that. Going back further, let's go back to the original uh, place where this conflict started. Abraham's first son was Ishmael, born to Sarai's Egyptian maid, Hagar, after Sarai believed she had passed the age of conception. In those days, it was traditional. If a wife could not bear a child, she could give her maid to bear a child on her behalf. Abraham was then 86 years old. Now, God promised Hagar that Ishmael would be the forebear of many descendants. Um, you can see those, um, the Arabs in Genesis 25, and I use that because if you read the names in that particular passage, 12 through 18, you'll find most of the names, or many of the names, you could identify with the Arab names we see today and said he would be a wild donkey of a man who would live in hostile hostility to his brothers. Now, a wild donkey of a man we might regard as rather a derogatory term, but in those days, a wild donkey was actually quite a, uh, a, an animal of, of some admiration because it was very headstrong and would do whatever it wanted. So that's in itself is not too bad, but the key term is hostility to his brothers. And it's repeated twice, first in Genesis 16 when he's about to be born, and then later at the end when it talks about the Arabs who still live in hostility to their brothers. Now let's jump forward a bit. In 1916, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, wrote, the Arabs are even less stable than the Turks. If properly handled, they would remain in a state of political mosaic, a tissue of small, jealous principalities incapable of cohesion. Those were his words. And just a reminder of those who might not know Lawrence Arabia, he was a, an archaeologist who went to uh, northern Syria before World War I. And when the war started, he was uh, sent to fight in the uh, Middle East. Uh, only had a minor position to start off with, but the Arab Bureau wanted to know what was going on. Uh, and they convinced the British Army to send him uh, to join the Arab rebellion against the Turks. A reminder that at that stage, most of the Royal Navy had started to run on oil and Arabia was the place where you got oil from. So it was British interest to be able to seize Arabia so they could keep uh, getting the oil for the Royal Navy. So for those of you who might not seen it before, one of the best movies ever made. Ah, get this going shortly. Here we go. One of the most dramatic scenes in Lawrence of Arabia, who, those who know it.
Just go a little bit, for, jump a little bit further forward. Yes. Why? This is my well. I have drunk from it. You are welcome. He was my friend. That? Yes. That. This best of yours? No. His. His? My. Then I will use it. was a hazmi of the Benny Sand. I know. I am Ali ibn al-Kharish. I've heard of you. So, what was a hazmi doing here? He was taking me to help Prince Faisal. You have been sent from Cairo? Yes. I have been in Cairo for my schooling. I can both read and write. My Lord Faisal already has an Englishman. Yes. What is your name? My name is for my friend. None of my friends is a murderer. You are angry, English. Mm. He was nothing. The well is everything. The Hazimi may not drink at our wells. He knew that. Salam. Hat, hat, hat. Mm. Sherif Ali, so long as the Arabs fight tribe against tribe, so long will they be a little people, a silly people, barbarous and cruel as you are. Okay, well, thank you for listening to uh, that excerpt, and I hope we didn't delay too long, but to me that illustrates all that we've just read on those previous few slides. Abraham's second son was Isaac, born to Sarah after God. Now notice I've changed from Abraham to Abraham because God had changed the names from Sarai to Sarah after God promised she would conceive at the age of 90. God said that his covenant with Abraham 
offspring would be reckoned through Isaac. And you see that Genesis 17 and also Genesis 21. So twice repeated. God promised Isaac land of uh, Canaan as well. Ishmael, then 14 years of old, and Hagar were expelled from Abraham's, Abraham's household when he mocked Isaac after his birth. But God preserved them and provided water in the desert. And we do see references to them uh, as God has given a promise to the descendants of Ishmael. Now, moving ahead now, the first battle between the two brothers, the descendants of the two brothers, that as far as I can see, happen, uh, happens uh, when Gideon was in charge. Israel's and uh, trans Israelis and the trans Jordan raiders, that is Midianites and Arabs, is recorded in Judges versus uh, chapter six and seven. The trans, oops, I'm getting a bit dark here. I'm going to have to turn the light on. Sorry about that, guys. The trans Jordan raiders had invaded Israel at the time of the harvest, like a locust plague, is what was recorded. But Gideon used just 300 men to spring a night surprise attack, causing the raiders to turn in hostility on each other as they fled. See the uh, outcome, the hostility, the fact that it's a relatively small number that can turn a multitude to flight. We're going to see that is repeated later on. Now we're jumping further ahead now. We're jumping uh, the, uh, towards the end of the Byzantine uh, era, uh, certainly as far as the Middle East is concerned. From about 610 AD, Byzantine, that is the, uh, the old Roman Empire based in uh, Constantinople, and the Persian Empire exhausted each other in a 20-year war, whilst taking little notice of messages from an obscure prophet down in Arabia. They're more interested in fighting each other. Many Jews were slaughtered by the Byzantine forces in the reconquest of Jerusalem about 600 AD after the Jews had supported uh, a Persian invasion. They still resented Roman occupation and the destruction of their holy city and its temple. In other words, uh, they would fight for anyone as long as they were fighting the Romans. Whilst the Arabian prophet himself died in 632 AD, his successors rapidly conquered Persia, then Syria, and then Palestina. In the absence of the slaughtered Jews, the Arabs emigrated into the land. Now we're jumping in oh, about uh, 1,400 years ahead almost. Uh, maybe not quite, maybe 1,350 years ahead. We're getting to the real point of which we're going to talk about the conflict. The Balfour Declaration and the British Mandate. I'll leave that uh, letter up there. You can read it yourself. Addressed to dear Lord Rothschild, a uh, great British um, philanthropist, and, uh, but of Jewish uh, descent. You can read what he says there. He's going to offer in favour of the establishment of Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Why was it written? In the depths of World War I, with the Bolshevik Revolution threatening, uh, they needed to, uh, to uh, threatening to take the, uh, Russia out of the war, Britain needed all the support it could muster. Note the date there, November the 2nd. Five days later, the Red Guard stormed the Winter Palace in Petrograd now, St. Petersburg. And indeed, that's exactly what the uh, Bolsheviks did, though by that stage anyway, the Russian army was revolting and uh, mutinying, and that was already the writing was on the wall that uh, Russia was no longer to be trusted. Not only that, this is 1917. The year before, uh, Britain had lost hundreds of thousands in the Somme. Before that, the French had lost equal numbers on the Verdun battlefield. And indeed, in 1917, the French uh, uh, army was uh, mutinying as well. So Britain really uh, was at a position where it was really fighting it tough. And there was no guarantee the Germans would not win the war. The other thing is they wanted support from the US Jews to maximise 
US involvement in World War I. By the second, when this letter was written, not one American soldier had died in the conflict. And so there was some anxiety on the British part that the, uh, that the US may not get heavily involved in the war. The other thing is they wanted a friendly nation near the Suez Canal. And of course, if they'd given the Jews their home next to the Suez Canal, then they could hopefully re get rewarded by having a agreement to keep the Suez Canal open. And finally, the declaration responded to pleas from the Zionist president and scientist Heim Weizmann, who developed an efficient method to make cordite. He was a professor at one of the uh, British universities and he used, uh, I think it was acetone, uh, as a means to efficiently make cordite, which of course is used uh, as the means to um, propel shells out of a gun. And he indeed became the first Israeli president. But because of their desperation, the British were also making promises to other people. The McMahon Hussein correspondence, 10 letters between McMahon, the British High Commissioner to Egypt, 1915 16 to Hussein bin Ali, Sheriff of Mecca, promising Arab control of most of the territory between Persia and Egypt. And then, of course, uh, for those that might know, it's Sykes Pico Agreement. In early 1916, divided some Arab lands between British and French control, though it did not specifically this Palestine in whole, only the cities of Haifa and Accra. When the war ended, the Zionists met with Faisal, Hussein's son, two weeks before the start of the Versailles Peace Conference, a conference to um, agree to peace uh, after World War I, in order to resolve differences. The resulting Faisal Weizmann Agreement was signed on 3rd of January 1919, together with a letter written by Lawrence of Arabia in Faisal's name to Felix Frankfurter in March 1919. The agreement was used by the Zionist delegation to argue that their plans for, a Palestinian, for Palestine had a prior Arab approval. However, the Zionists did omit Faisal's handwritten caveat that the agreement was conditional on Palestine being within the area of Arab independence. In other words, if there was to be a Jewish homeland, it was to be under the overall control of Arabs and the Arab uh, national movement. In the end, Sharaf Hussein bin Ali, who led the Arab rebellion against the Turks, refused to sign the 1919 Versailles Peace Treaty, as he believed he had been betrayed. And that's just a picture of uh, a group at uh, Versailles. We have, um, yes, that's Prince Faisal there, uh, who was there on behalf of his father, and that's Lawrence of Arabia, the real Lawrence of Arabia, right there beside him, along with the others that were grouped there. In 1920, at the San Remo Conference, the League of Nations assigned both Palestine and Transjordan to British control. That was actually also in accord with the sykes pico Agreement. Uh, Transjordan is what we call modern Jordan. After strenuous objection from the British Foreign Minister, the statement concerning the historical connections of the Jews with Palestine was reincorporated into the mandate in December 1920. Of course, great significance there to say that the Jews did have a historic uh, connection with the land. Uh, obviously, as a um, uh, a foreign minister, you do try and weasel out of words you might have once uttered, uh, but uh, that was not, it was not actually Lord Balfour anymore, it was, a, it was his replacement. The draft was submitted to the League of Nations on 7th of December, 1920. Now, the Jews started to arrive, uh, well, they'd already been arriving, but a greater number started to arrive in the land. Herzl had never mentioned the Arabs of Palestine in any of his speeches to Zionist conferences. It was not until 1925 that Heim Weizmann warned, Palestine is not Rhodesia and 600,000 Arabs live here who have exactly the same rights to their homes as we do, as we have to our national home. And I've got to admire Heim Weizmann for his honesty there. The Zionist labour policies insisted on hiring only Jewish workers, both security and to promote jobs for the new Jewish arrivals. As land was purchased by Zionists from absent Arab landlords, resentment grew among the local unemployed Arab majority to these new 
exclusivist minority intruders. Unfortunately, the Arabs chose not to try to negotiate a compromise as they believed they were completely in the right. Then foolishly, in 1922, the British governor appointed Mohammed Sayed Haj Adnin El Husseini as Mufti of Jerusalem, as much for appeasement of the Arabs as for any Islamic qualifications. In fact, he was the most, for example, we'll see shortly, he'd already started to cause trouble. And it was actually a Jewish governor trying to say, oh, well, if I look to point anyone else, there'll be more trouble, so I'll just take the easy route. Uh, bad move. Hazardin had been a Turkish officer and then a keen supporter of British rule until he learned of the Balfour Declaration. He now turned his hatred on the British and the Jews. Before he was even appointed in 1920, he'd already fomented riots. And again on Yom Kippur in 1928, when 100 Jews were killed. In August 29, about 70 Jews were killed in Hebron when rumours spread the Jews were about to take the Temple Mount. Remember that picture I showed at the front, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. To be fair to the Arabs, and let's, let's be even handed here, some 435 Jews who survived were hidden by local Arab families. But in 1935, Hajj Admin uh, launched an uprising involving killings of, on all sides, resulting in more than 2,000 deaths, including many leading Arabs as well who were seen to be too close to the British, setting back the Arab cause as wise local leadership was lost. By 1936, he was in contact with Nazi Germany and after fleeing Palestine, made his way to Lebanon, then Iraq, and finally to Berlin in 1941. He was joined by a number of other Palestinian fighters who were trained for sabotage by the SS. But as Jews started to flee Nazi expansion in Europe, British clamped down on Jewish immigration to Palestine to appease the Arabs. This policy continued even after World War I, uh, World War II rather, uh, even to those who'd survived the Holocaust. Jewish resentment in Palestine rose and Jewish resistance groups such as Ergun and the Stern Gang formed to overthrow British rule and attack Arabs. In 1944, with the end of the war in sight, Ergun, under the leadership of Menachem Begin, later Israeli Prime Minister, began to attack the British administration in Palestine, including Jerusalem's King David Hotel, uh, killing 91 people. In the same year, the Stern Gang murdered Lord Moyne, the British Minister of State for Middle East in Cairo. Let's move on to what happened then. There are two words for what happened in 40, 47, 48. Uh, for the Israelis, it was the War of Independence. For the Palestinians, it's Nakba, meaning the disaster. Having paid a great price during World War II, Britain was war weary. It had no desire to spend more blood or treasure. So on 29th of 1947, during General Assembly by a vote of 33 for, 13 against, with 10 abstained, adopted UN Resolution 181, recommending to the UK as the mandatory power, that's the mandate power for Palestine, and to all other members of the UN, the plan of partition. With about 32% of the population, the Jews were allocated 56% of the territory. It contained just under 500,000 Jews and 438,000 Arabs, and most of it, that's the, their part, the orange part, was in the Negev Desert. The Jews very reluctantly accepted it as they lost control of the Jewish quarter in the old city at the foot of the Western Wall. No, that is in the middle of Arab territory under UN control. There is no, there's no orange territory anywhere near it. It is fair that to say that the uh, Jews did get the uh, the coastal portion, quite lush coastal portion, uh, up on the Mediterranean coast and also around the Sea of Galilee, but much of it down here was desert. But the Arab nations utterly rejected it and their people demanded action. During this period, the Jewish and Arab communities' British mandate, and this is from the UN vote to partition, um, the Brits got what they wanted, they can get out, let's get out of here and let's keep ourselves safe. Um, Jewish and Arab communities and British mandate clashed. 
while the British organised their withdrawal and intervened, um, intervened only occasionally. About 100 people were being killed each week. The Army of the Holy War under Abdul al Qadir al Husseini came from Egypt, and with several hundred men from Egypt, and having recruited a few thousand Palestinian volunteers, al Husseini organised the blockade, blockade of the 100,000 Jewish residents of Jerusalem. And there's a picture of uh, Bab al Wadi, the lead up going through the hills up to Jerusalem from the plains uh, near the Mediterranean. And even this one, it shows you they've got already blockaded. You see stones and a log thrown across there to stop any supplies getting up the road. On the left, you see a picture of what happened when the Jews did try to get through. They were ambushed, um, their trucks were set on fire and they were looted and uh, many of them died. Today, if you go up the same road, it's now a four lane highway, you can see some of the remaining wrecked trucks lined up as a memorial. And this would be uh, the Independence Day here. You can see they're decorated. Uh, when I was there in 1990 uh, and thereabouts, you actually had them uh, more scattered up the road, but apparently uh, uh, scrap iron people kept raiding them. So they've actually protected them a lot more than they did about 30 years ago. Atrocities increase. On 9th of April 1948, the Ergun and Stern gang, uh, they'd been asked for help by the regular Israeli army, the Haganah, but um, uh, they were, chose their own target and stormed a neutral Arab village, which made peace with the surrounding, with the nearby suburbs in Jerusalem, the Jewish suburbs, and attacked them and killed at least 100, 107 Palestinian Arabs and raped the women. The horror of this atrocity stunned the other villages into desertion. It had a perhaps um, uh, an effect that perhaps was really wanted, warranted, but it did cause such horror. Certainly Al Albert Einstein and many overseas Jews absolutely abhorred what was done in their name at that village. Four days later, a Jewish medical convoy taking medical star patients from, uh, to the Hadessa Hospital on Mount Scopus were ambushed by Palestinians. Just a reminder, this is in Jerusalem itself, Hadassah Hospital's, um, uh, Mount Scopus is just a bit of a spur of, not far from the Mount of Oz, but a little bit further around, just to the north of Jerusalem. 78 Jewish doctors, nurses, students, patients, and fighters, and one Jewish soldier, British soldier, rather, was killed in the attack. But the Jews had refused to wait for a British escort. That's a picture of the wrecked convoy. Then the Arab Legion attacked. After some hesitation, because he actually would, he was the one Arab leader who would talk to the Jews, uh, King Abdul Jordan gave the order for his Arab Legion to seize the West Bank, that part that was allocated to the Arabs, including Jerusalem. And here we have um, on the far right, we have Major Tell, the, the main. Um, Jordanian uh, leader of the armed group. The Arab Legion was the most disciplined and well-trained Arab army, which was very fortunate to the Jews as the Arab Legion did not commit atrocities. Any prisoner they took fell into the, under their own personal protection. Maybe you remember the story of Lot in uh, Sodom when the men of that city tried to come in and grab the angels of visiting it was a part of Middle Eastern culture that someone, someone's under your protection, sorry, in your, your position, in your, under your keep, they deserve your personal protection. There's right in the centre of that image are, in fact, some Jewish prisoners they're taken. And that included the Jews from the Jewish quarter, which was then captured, and uh, they were evacuated by the uh, Arab Legion. The Arab Legion then, as I say, captured the old city, was halted by street fighting outside the walled city. They were good at um, fighting in the open, but when they got into street fighting, city fighting, it became more difficult. They almost starved the remaining Jewish section of Jerusalem until the Burma Road was built over rugged hills from Tel Aviv around the road blocked Bab El Wadi. Uh, so Burma Road is not in Burma. Uh, it was a name colloquially given to a, uh, a road uh, that went up the very rugged steep side of the Wadi and was hacked out in feverish efforts uh, to get to Jerusalem before they all starved there. And they got it just before a ceasefire was uh, called uh, so that the um, 
the Israelis could claim that this was not something that they could rent during the ceasefire because it had already been built. In fact, they took some American journalists up on the road just before the ceasefire was called to have uh, independent witness. The road was theirs already. But here we have Abdullah in the front of uh, Arab, the local Christian um, dignitaries, Orthodox dignitaries in uh, Jerusalem. So after the fight, uh, the War of Independence, I'm not going to get any more detail. I'm just going to show you the consequence. Well, we're going to talk about the consequences. There on the left is what I showed you before. That all of that central area belonged to the Arab uh, forces. Uh, and just to give an impression of what's in that area, anything that's dark means vegetation, relatively um, good to grow crops and so on. But anything to the bottom there is desert. You don't want to really get much out of that. So that's the good area to have. And that's, of course, largely what they managed to increase. In fact, if you look at the picture, there are two significant points. At the end of the War of Independence, they had got right up to the edge of the old city, right up there. And they'd certainly expanded all the way from the coast to the Jordan River over here in Galilee. So that's a significant increase in what they attained at the, when the ceasefire was called in 1949. Israel lost over 6,000 people, about 1% of its population. About 4,000 were soldiers and the rest were civilians. The exact number of foreign Arab losses is unknown, it's estimated anywhere between 4,000 and 15,000. In 1951, the UN Concilia uh, Conciliation Commission for Palestine estimated that some 700,000 Palestinian refugees were displaced. Many of their descendants were still languishing in refugee, um, still languish, even today, still languish in refugee camps in neighbouring countries as they are not allowed to assimilate. They want to return to their homes in Israel. The proportion of Christian Arabs in the Israeli West Bank has dropped from 10% pre 1948 to about 3% now. Uh, as a small aside here, not that's that relevant to the conflict, it's been interesting. I noted. In a side note, that Chile now has the largest proportion of Christian Palestinians. Beginning in 1948 and then continuing until 1972, an estimated 800,000 to 1 million Jews fled or expelled from Arab countries. So you've got to look top and bottom, top and bottom. And I believe this is up to 1972, and we haven't covered that yet, but um, there was an almost equal proportion, perhaps even more Jews, who were pushed out of other countries that then had to come to uh, what is now Israel. Okay, I promised I'd uh, jump 56. So again, now Israel seizes the West Bank, the Six Day War. After the 56 war that I was going to skip, during which Israel had invaded the Gaza Strip and Sinai to protect the Suez Canal from Egyptian nationalisation, the US forced Israel, UK and France to withdraw to keep, try and keep the Arabs from turning to the Soviets. President Nasser of Egypt interpreted this as his victory and turned to the Soviets anyway, rearming with modern Russian weapons confident he could get revenge for 48, the Nakba. Syria continued to bombard Israeli settlements in the Galilee, a region from, uh, Galilee region from the Golan Heights. I lived in the kibbutz, or stayed in the kibbutz up there and certainly saw the uh, some of the bomb shelters that were still there. As tensions arose in early 67, Israel reminded Egypt that any attempt to close its sea route to the Red Sea would be an act of war, as Israel got most of its oil in those days from Shah's Iran. Remember, this is pre Ayatollahs. The Shah of Iran was um, a friend of Israel and he would be supplying their oil. But in May 1967, President Nasser announced the Red Sea route that's the Straits of Tehran, would be closed and evicted the UN peacekeepers that were keeping it open. Just a reminder where that is. There is the Straits of Tehran, Ilat, Israel is up to the top right here, Saudi Arabia is over here, and Egypt control all of here, and they, that's what they blocked there. And that, to Israel, was an act of war by stopping the world getting up to Ilat. What Israel did not know, that in late May, Jordan signed a secret pact with Egypt 
that it would invite an Egyptian general to take charge of bombarding Israel in the event of war, but itself would not invade. Trying to have it both ways. On the 5th of June, the Israeli Air Force made a surprise attack on Egyptian airfields, wiping out the Egyptian Air Force on the ground. In just a few days, the Israeli Army and Air Force swept the Egyptian Army from Gaza and the Sinai. Later, it captured the Golan Heights from Syria. Uh, putting into context, I had just joined the Air Force as an officer cadet. Uh, this is the Australian Air Force as an officer cadet. And certainly, um, we were very uh, elated to see how air power was so convincingly employed. And at that time, um, we actually made a present, we were invited to make a presentation of uh, how, um, how spectacular it was. So I have some strong memories of, of that particular war from the point of view of aggression. Israel had warned J Jordan not to intervene. About an hour after the Israeli air attack on Egypt, the Egyptian commander of the Jordanian army was ordered by Cairo to begin attacks on Israel. In the initial confused situation, the Jordanians were told that Egypt had repelled the Israeli airstrikes. The Israeli Air Force destroyed the Jordanian Air Force on the ground after it had made its first attack on Israel. With dominant air power, Israel swept the Jordanian army out of the West Bank in just two day, or three days, 5th through 7th of June. On the 7th of June, General Dayan, the commander of the Israeli armies, initially ordered his troops not to enter the old city. But on hearing the UN was about to clear a ceasefire, he changed his mind and without his cabinet clearance, decided to capture it. To me, that is one of the most moving pictures. Um, obviously, Israeli soldiers who come, in fact, they attack from the opposite direction, they attack from the direction of Mount of Olives, not uh, from the West Jerusalem. I'm broken, of course, there they are against their most revered um, place of worship, the Western Wall, the only remains of Herod's temple. Of the 1 million Palestinians in West Bank and Gaza, some 300,000 fled, mostly to Jordan. But following the Palestinian Black September uprising against Jordanian authority, and almost a quick aside here, the Palestinians essentially were outnumbering the Jordanians in their own land, and uh, they basically thought they could do whatever they wanted. And then there was a major uprising, and uh, they were actually, the, as I told you, the um, Arab Legion was the most efficient Arab army and they were out, uh, the Palestinians were pushed out. Most were expelled and scattered to other countries, especially Jordan. Some 100,000 fled the Golan Heights to Syria. The amazing Israeli victory encouraged significant Jewish migration to Israel from Western countries, as well as South Africa. And of course, on a, a lesser, oh, sorry, on, on an adverse note, enforced migration from Muslim countries who are very angry at the result. Having lost hope in Arab nations' military victory, various Palestinian groups turned to terror. Raids across the border from Lebanon and Jordan resulted in uh, Israeli retaliation. The massacre of Israeli athletes at the 1972 Munich Olympics by Black September Group led Israel hunting down the terrorists. The movie Munich, of course, is uh, around if you want to watch it. This is how that hunt went. Uh, Eric Banner. Uh, the Australian actor, and the Jewish Australian actor, of course, plays the lead role in that. And of course, there were a number of airline hijackings with Israeli countering at the Entebbe raid in Uganda. Uh, Uganda at that stage was under the control of Idi Amin, and he had um, uh, some sympathy to the uh, uh, Arab cause, and he wasn't going to let them, so the Israelis had to mount their own very long range raid. And it was there that um, um, Netanyahu, um, Netanyahu's brother, Jonathan, uh, Benjamin Yenyo's brother, Jonathan, was killed. He was the leader of that raid, but he, he got killed on it. And then, of course, the uh, Lockerbie bombing over Scotland. It was the hijacking of the Achille Loro passenger vessel off uh, Egypt. And the European left-wing factions, um, even though they're largely socialist, would often capture ho hostages and other things and demand uh, that uh, release of Palestinian um, 
the people that have been captured uh, who are their own fellow terrorists. Uh, there's just one picture of, uh, I think it was in Jordan, uh, some hijacked planes were blown up. Okay, I'm now going to skip the 73 Yom Kippur War and move along to 7882, uh, Operation Peace for Galilee, which is an invasion of Lebanon. Following its 76 civil war, Lebanon's central authority was fractured, allowing Palestinian liberalization, liberation organization and its offshoots set up bases in Lebanon from which it coordinated attacks on Jewish targets, both in Israel and also in Europe. Lebanon declared a ceasefire with Israel in June 81, but it could not control the Palestinians and their rocket attacks continued. Israel countered by forming an alliance with the Maronite Christians of Lebanon. On 3rd June 82, the Abu Nidal group, that's one of the Palestinian groups, attempted to assassinate Israeli ambassador to the UK. And three days later, Israel launched Peace for Galilee, Galilee an invasion of Lebanon. By mid-June, Israel besieged Beirut for three months until the PLO evacuated from Lebanon. Before that, on the 14th of September, up to 2,000 Palestinian men were killed by Christian allies of Israel in the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps where militants were trained. General Ariel Sharon was blamed for not controlling his allies. That's a rather um, brutal image of, of what happened. The invasion removed PLO presence from Lebanon. However, the removal of the PLO also paved the way for the rise of other militant groups, particularly the Shiite Hezbollah, backed by Ayatollah's Iran. Israel tried to maintain a presence in southern Lebanon, but by 2000, continuing casualties to guerrilla attacks forced it to withdrew, withdraw. Its Christian allies fled southern Lebanon, which is now controlled by Hezbollah, which claims to be the only Islamic army to have defeated Israel. Let's move ahead now, 87 through 93. I actually first visited Israel in 87 on a um, with a military, um, sorry, with a, with a defence project. And uh, at that stage in 87, before the uprising, uh, we were able to travel all over Israel. Went to Jericho, the West Bank, went to Jericho and all sorts of places without much fear at all. But that ended by the end of that year. It's called the Intifada, which in Arabic means, largely means uprising. Uh, it has been used in Arabic before. I think in 1950, it was an Intifada in Iraq. Since 1967, both Gaza and the West Bank were under Israeli control, often with swift, arbitrary reprisals for any trouble from the Arabs. On 8th of December, 87, an Israeli army tank transporter apparently accidentally crashed into a row of cars containing Palestinians returning from working in Israel at the Erez checkpoint in Gaza. Now, that's a modern view of that checkpoint. It probably looked a lot older then. But basically, uh, a very... Uh, yes, a, a tragic thing, but one that certainly caused an uproar and, and caused what's about to happen. Four workers were killed, seven seriously injured, as seen by hundreds of other Arab workers at the crossing. Next day, riots broke out in both Gaza and the West Bank with rock and petrol bomb thrown. Highways were seeded with nails. The PLO and the communities resisted extending the violence of the world opinion saw this as a popular and moderate uprising. The PLO did grow concerned, though, about the number of it's up to a 1,000 of Arabs killed by their own people because they suspected them of Israeli collaboration. World media showed the Arab children and youths being shot by the Israeli army, and Israel's reputation and tourism dropped. The Intifada broke the image of Jerusalem as a united Israeli city. The Intifada was recognised an occasion where the Palestinians, acting cohesively and independently of their leadership or assistance of neighbouring Arab states, such as in Jordan, lost influence in the West Bank. So they, it was, it was a, a, a actually something that gained them uh, a positive image to many in the world. The success of the Intifada gave the PLO confidence to moderate its political aims. In Algiers, in November 88, it voted for the first time to recognise Israel's legitimacy, to accept all the relevant UN resolutions going back to the partition vote in 1947, and to adopt the principle 
of a two-state solution. Okay, now let's move ahead to 2000, the second intifada, Al-Aqsa. The Oslo Accord, signed in 93 and 95, was supposed to bring peace by phase of Israelis from the West Bank and Gaza. But instead, violence continued. In July 2000, Cape David talks broke down largely over the right of return of Palestinian refugees to their home cities in Israel, their ancestral towns. Two months later, before the 2000 Israeli elections, PM candidate, Prime Minister candidate Ariel Sharon visited the Temple Mount, the holiest site of Judaism and the third holiest of Muslims. For Muslims. It was 10 days after the anniversary of the massacre of Sabra and Chantila, for which Sharon was held responsible. The day after Sharon's visit was a Friday. Palestinians roused by Friday prayers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque threw rocks down from the Temple Mount onto the Jewish worshippers at the Western Wall. Riot spread. The Israelis in, uh, engaged in gunfire, tank and air attacks and targeted killings. Palestinians engaged in suicide bombings, rock throwing, gunfire and rocket attacks. Over five years, the death toll, including both combatants and civilians, is estimated about 3,000 Palestinians and 1,000 Israelis, as well as 64 foreigners. As a result, a war was built to separate the West Bank from Israel to stop suicide bombers. That's a picture within Jerusalem. Now let's turn to the Gaza wars. There's a picture of where Gaza is, right on the south coast of Israel, nestled up against Egypt at the bottom there. Ashkelon and Ashtar, we'll talk about those shortly. The Gaza Strip, without the Gaza Strip, is a densely populated 1.5 million population city with a very high proportion of Palestinian refugees and camps longing to return to their ancestral homes in Israel. Many are either un- or underemployed. We did, in fact, in 1990, have a, a Gaza uh, gardener come up and work uh, and do our gardening for us. In 2005, um, Ariel Sharon, now Prime Minister, decided to withdraw Israeli forces and, and settlers from Gaza. The continued strain on the Israeli army did not warrant continued occupation. Israel handed power to the Palestinian Authority, who they could largely get on with. In 2006 elections, though, Hamas party won power in Gaza. Hamas is linked to the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. The Hamas Charter, the original charter anyway, in 1988, said that Hamas was founded to liberate Palestine, including modern day Israel, from Israeli occupation and to establish an Islamic state in the area that is now Israel, the West Bank and Gaza Strip. It later moderated this as long as Israel redrew, re, redrew to the pre-67 borders and allowed Palestinian refugees to return to their ancestral homes. An Israeli corporal in down the war had what, what went on there. In 2006, just after Hamas had gained power, an Israeli corporal was abducted from the Gaza border post at his Gaza post by tunnel. Israeli entered Gaza for three months searching for him. He was eventually traded in 2011. So they went in for three months and Gaza responded with rocket fire on nearby Israeli settlements. 80 Gaza residents were killed. 2007, hundreds of rockets fired from Gaza. Israel imposes a blockade. blockade. No food or employment went in or allowed. More rockets attacks, now reaching Ashkelon. So Israel invades and attacks Hamas. 115 Gazans are killed. Egypt arranges a truce and the blockade is partly lifted. 2009, Gaza war. After rockets continue to be fired into Israel, IDF launches a major offensive. 1,400 Gazans are killed and 13 Israelis uh, and, and Hamas now reach Ashdod. And that's where I'm just gonna um, make the comment illustrated by this picture. Um, by the time this was occurring, uh, Kevin was my manager at, uh, uh, at BA Systems where I was then working and uh, we had a 
teaming agreement with one of our subcontractors working in Ashdod, and we could not go to Ashdod because our company security clearance, uh, rather, um, insurance policy would not allow Australian employees to get within rocket range of Gaza. So for both uh, Kevin and I, there's now becoming a more personal note on uh, what this was all about. 2014 Gaza war, worse than 88, uh, 2008 and 9. 22,000, 2,200, yeah, 2,200 Gazans, including 14,000 civilians were killed uh, versus 67 Israelis. 2018, probably the latest images most of us remember, Palestine Land Day protests killed 168 Gazans who advanced to the border with Israel. Remember, the great clamour is to get into Israel to go back to their home cities and villages. Of late, to summarise now, Hamas has largely tried to rein in attacks on Israel, but splinter groups still attack. Uh, as we've already said, right back to the Old Testament, um, Arabs tend to fracture into different uh, groups. Mind you, so does Israel, just having a look at the recent elections there are about, I don't know. I mean, might know, but I think we've got about, uh, as, as much as I read, there must be 10 different parties all jockeying to form um, uh, a successful government. So it goes in the Middle East. Israel has developed Iron Dome rocket defence, which shoots down many rockets. Now I'm going to summarise, and I'm going to conclude, I'm going to read the following from the prophet Ezekiel. Therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the, show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name that you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Thank you, Kevin. Um, okay, thank you very much, um, uh, Steve. Uh, you can now all unmute your microphones. And um, Steve, if you could yeah, stop sharing and so we can uh, open it to public uh, forum. So um, I said I'd go through the um, uh, chat questions, but there was only one person who put a comment in the chat. And that was me. So, <laughs> um, so just um, went on your slide on the petition. Um, um, obviously, the um, Israel was given control of uh, the west northwest coast. Yes, and uh, so which included Tel Aviv, which is now the capital. So, uh, I was just wondering whether that was actually um, the um, uh, reason why Tel Aviv actually became the capital for Israel? Oh, um, I, look, I, I better see, Ami may well have a better view on this than I. Do you have any comment on that, Ami? Don't remember ever that Tel Aviv was the capital, like it was all the time Jerusalem. Oh, oh is, is that the case? It's kind of the commercial uh, capital of uh, Israel, though, isn't it? The, yeah, I, I, I can compare it maybe to Auckland and Wellington. But Wellington is the capital, but probably Auckland is the main business in the industrial city. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. but, um, from my knowledge, Jerusalem was always considered as the, the capital. Yes, yes. Though, though Tel Aviv is much, much more populate, uh, business city, all the, most of the industry is there. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. David Ben Gurion, who was the leader at the time in Israel, he prayed the proclamation of independence from Tel Aviv. So the first um, Jewish government was in Tel Aviv, but they always regarded Jerusalem as the capital. Uh, and so Jerusalem's been the capital. Uh, for all other nations, though, for political reasons, have chosen to set up their embassies right. in uh, Tel Aviv. Um, being the major city of Israel and not Jerusalem. And that, that's been against um, Israeli wishes. Israel would always like all the nations to have their 
uh, embassies and their representation in Jerusalem. And it's only been in recent times, especially with the move of the Americans, uh, that they actually set up their, um, their embassy in Jerusalem. And so a few other nations have followed suit. <clears throat> Thank you, Dave. Well, um, having dealt with all the chat lines, um, I'm now open it up for people to um, ask questions or to make comments on what Stu's presented. So it's all over to you. Well, I could, I could uh, maybe add a few comments. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, we talked about the. Uh, in places like Amman in Jordan, uh, they have these uh, refugee camps and you get this sort of image of uh, tents and so on. It's not like that at all. Some of these refugee camps, uh, very fine brick built buildings which have been there for generations now. Um, so it's, it's not what we often think of as a camp. Uh, the second point is uh, not all Arabs uh, anti-Israel. Um, uh, uh, I can think in particular of Ethiopia where until quite recently the Arabs um, the, or the, the, the Muslims anyway um, and, the, and the Jews got on very well. If you think of Jordan across the other side of the Red Sea um, now nowadays because uh, you've got uh, this militant Islam there um, the Jew, the, there aren't any Jews left there. But it's interesting, if you actually look at the minarets on the mosques in, uh, in Sinai, in Yemen, they were actually built by Jews. And so you've got these Muslim minarets, but they've actually got stars of David on them, in the foundations. And uh, you think of places like, um, like, like Jordan, where until fairly recently they, um, there, there, there were a lot of uh, Christians and even some Jews there. Um, and I worked in Oman for a while and most people had no idea who the Jews were. I, I had an assistant, he asked me once, who are these Jews? Are they a tribe up in the north somewhere? He really hadn't got a clue. Uh, so it is not like a, a uniform uh, anti-Israeli view throughout the, the Muslim Arab world. But the third thing I, I think I would make is we can't think uh, in terms of a, a solution on geopolitical grounds because with the rise of Muslim extremism um, some of those Muslim extremists, and they've actually said so themselves quite vociferously, say they will never accept um, uh, Jews in Israel because um, Islam is by nature a supremacist religion. Right. And uh, the very existence of Israel is an affront to them. So um, I think the only way... Uh, we're ever going to get peace is to kind of Christianize uh, the the Muslims there. I, I don't see any other way you can do it. Oops. So yeah, just make those points. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. And that's been the problem. Look, um, fully support Gordon's view on that. Um, it's very sad about Jordan because the Jordanian King Abdullah actually reached out to Golda Meir just before the War of Independence and, and they yeah. were on speaking terms. But sadly for uh, him, he had, uh, as you say, the more radical members in his country would not let him uh, do anything about it. Um, they, he was forced into the position he was to, had to take, yeah. And of course, he was assassinated, I think, in about 1950 by some of the more radical people. So, um, yeah, you try and walk out. I sit on the fence in that conflict and you're likely to find yourself in great danger. Is that the basic problem that you have a, a large majority of moderates, but there's always some uh, extremists around who are going to spoil it? Oh, 
Um, I think I think Gordon's right. Um, if you if you read the Quran, oh, look, I've got to be careful here. I'm sure there are very moderate Muslims around here who have a much more sanguine view, but there are others who say, well, no, we. Well, in fact, in their view, they conquered all the way up to where was it? Um, I'm trying to think of halfway up uh, Potiers, I think it was. They got to. Uh, in the invasion back in about 1730. And uh, to them, it's wherever the high water mark of the Islamic uh, conquests were. And that includes half of France. Mm. But you've also had Israeli extremists as well, haven't you? Oh, yeah, 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 mm. definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, in fact, when we were there, um, there is a, as we've indicated, you've got, this is 1990, there was a, a point where the workers, particularly from Gaza, would gather at a particular point, would be picked up to go to various day jobs and uh, so on. Sadly, uh, this um, Israeli guys, remember if you serve in the military, you're given your M16 and you've got to keep it, but you're not supposed to get the ammunition. but this guy turned up at this point where a lot of Arabs were waiting to get their day jobs and he turned the gun on them and I think there was about 18 killed in that particular time. So yep, it happens and I've mentioned day uh, as in the Arab village that was uh, slaughtered and uh, atrocities committed as well. So yes, it's both sides. Uh, I think Stephen's quite right to bring up the Battle of Poitiers in, uh, in France, where the Muslims were trying to basically conquer Europe and uh, Islamize the whole of Europe. And had they succeeded, had they won that Battle of Poitiers, yeah. most or a good chunk of Southern Europe would be Muslim now. And a lot of Muslims still to this day, even though it's history now, uh, a lot of Muslims still feel quite sore about that. Yes, 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 they do. Yep. And in particular Spain, because they controlled Spain for what, a set number of centuries, didn't they? And uh, to have Spain taken from them still rankles them. Yeah. Mm. What role yeah, does well, Syria play in all this, Steve? I beg your pardon? What role does Syria play in all this? Oh, well, okay. Um, well, Syria's got its own problems, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> of course, we're not touching on this topic right now, but Syria yeah. is uh, an example of the great schism in Islam, just as we might have our own schisms. It's the Shiites and the uh, Sunnis which hate each other with a hatred. Pardon me. Um, there was a time, mind you, when Syria and Iraq actually agreed, when they were both socialist under the Ba'ath Party, and both were conquests more for nationalistic reasons. But um, now Syria, and in particular, has joined very much with uh, Iran to promote um, the apocalyptic. And that's why I, I, was, I was interested at times that it seemed that Israel was more keen to make peace with the Sunnis, and after all, it was the Sunnis who made it 9-11 happen, than they were with uh, the uh, Hezbollah. But, and again, I, I've got to be careful here. I'm not, I don't know that much about Shia, but I believe given that they lost to the Sunnis back in the big battle in about uh, 660 or thereabouts, had this apocalyptic view that one day Armageddon will happen and everything will, they'll be able to conquer the world. And um, Iran seems to have a much harder line and thus Syria seems to have a much harder line on Israel than others. For instance, Egypt has made peace with Israel, the Camp David back in 78. Syria has never made peace with Israel, and I don't think ever will. It's, it's got a more fundamental view uh, than Egypt has. Um, scripturally, Syria seems like, prophetically, it's... Well, the Bible refers to Syria being wiped off the map, pretty much. Yeah. You know, it's going to be annihilated. And sometimes I wonder whether we're close to that. Perhaps, you know? perhaps, perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, obviously we see the tragedy in Syria at the moment yeah. uh, between the two, two opposing groups of Islam. Mm -hmm. And very sadly, of course, uh, the Christians in the I mean, as much as I think Assad is a very bad, murderous dictator, at least he protects the Christians because they would rather be under his other white brand of um, Islam than face the more radical Sunnis who we saw what they did in northern Iraq. Uh, okay. um, yeah, so uh, it, it, 
I think it was uh, our former Prime Minister, um, uh, Tony Abbott, who said there are only bad guys up there, bad guys on either side. And we can't permit it any other way. Mm. How long did it take to cull all of your um, data down to that amount of time that you spoke? Ah, well, I'm surprised I got through as quickly as I did, actually. I thought I, um, I think I've tried to go through fairly quickly and leave it to the questions to elaborate anything. Mm. And that's obviously why I didn't go into details on the wars that I admitted because they only had peripheral, um, as far as I could see, only peripheral effect on that conflict between the Palestinians and the um, Israelis, uh, even though they were significant in their own right, they didn't actually have much to do with that particular conflict. Army, I don't want to kind of put you on the spot, but I'm just interested in uh, your reaction to, um, or your assessment of what Steve said. Well, the, the whole lecture, the speech was really comprehensive. It's bringing me back some memories. I, you didn't mention like that, that there was some, you mentioned the peace agreement with Egypt. There was another peace agreement with uh, Jordan. Yes. And there was a process, a uh, peace process with Yasser Arafat yes. and Yitzhak Rabin, Israeli yes. prime minister. It started yes. with the Oslo agreement. Yes. I think it was 93. Yes. And it ended up with the murder of the assassination of Tzhak okay. Rabin by, by yes. a Jewish yes. person. Yes. Religion, a uh, radical person yes. who shut him down um, at the back. Yes. And I think it was, it was at 95. It's, for, for me, it's un, un, like remarkable and something that no one's really can forget yeah. this this event and since then the peace process stopped yes but yes. Uh, th there was a chance yes there was uh, at I that think, time. yes uh, and look if i may go forward to 2000 um i think it was uh president clinton had uh had barack and uh I think uh, Yasser Arafat was there at the time, and they were almost there. The only sticking point was the right of return of the refugees to their home villages and towns in Israel. That was the one thing that Ehud Barak would not give way on. That was the one thing that, um, uh, that the Palestinians, particularly uh, the PLO to Yasser Arafat, insisted on, and that was the one thing that stop peace happening in 2000. And what is your opinion about the solution? Well, look, I, I have, well, I think Gordon is probably, uh, well, look, as a Christian, um, I am a Christian. Uh, I mean, I, I'm thinking, I, I do not see, I think a lot I see of the world is not necessarily going to end in a peaceful solution. I believe there is going to be an end and your own prophets, be it Zechariah or whatever, speak of Jerusalem being surrounded by lots of armies and by, I think, a third of the city falling until someone descends on the Mount of Olives. Now, as a Christian, I believe that is Yeshua and he will finally be revealed and uh, it says that they will look on him who they have pissed and that's, I believe, um, you know, my, as a Christian, take is when the Jews will see no prince in the hand of your Mashiach, and they will then identify who he is. That's my take on it uh, from the book, the prophet Zechariah. Stephen, just on the question of the, the demographics, yes. um, who's the, the, the dominant population in Israel at the moment? Is it the Palestinians or the in the Jews? Yeah, in the boundaries of Israel, I believe it is the Jews. I, I forget, oh, I should have looked that up. It is still the Jews, and that is why the return of refugees into uh, the, the boundary of Israel would upset that uh, demographic, demographic um, combination greatly. I don't know that it would come in as a maximum, but by the time you think of all the 
grandchildren, great grandchildren, etc., Palestinians in all the various camps, whatever, you would think that they would overwhelm the population of Jews in Israel. And do they have the same democratic vote as the Jews or not? Oh, yeah, those, sorry, those within the boundary of Israel, if you like, the Israeli Arabs do vote. And I forget, I think they generally get three or four peoples into the Knesset. Uh, again, um, I mean... Nowadays, uh, at this election, there are actually, they have two parties. One got, there were, I don't know if you're aware, there were election, the first, f first time election in two years. Yes, yes. It's quite fascinating and important and I would say even devastated time yeah. in, in Israel because yeah. uh, uh, it's, it's very hard for the government to create coalition. Of course. And, okay. and so the Arab countries have, I think, around 12 or 13 seats in, in the Knesset. Good, yeah. In, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so, the, so the, um, I think the proportion of Jews in the modern state of Israel is about 70%. Uh, and, but they would be overwhelmed if they allowed the uh, Palestinian Arabs to return into Israel and gave them citizenship. All Israeli Arabs have citizenship in, and can right. vote, just like anybody else. And they generally uh, co they form a coalitions with more left-wing or labor-type uh, governments in Israel, um, labor-type parties in Israel, rather than more right-wing and religious uh, Jewish uh, groups. Yes. And so, the, you know, Net Netanyahu, the current prime minister, and he's been there for, I think he's been the longest serving um, prime minister in Israel's history, hasn't he? He's uh, yes. beaten Ben-Gurion now, and he's more aligned with the, what you call the right-wing on the religious parties. It is always a coalition. There's usually one or two really big parties and then a whole lot of little parties. But Israel is a true democracy. And so everybody who's a citizen has the right to vote and to stand in parliament too. So, you know, unlike a lot of the Arab countries, I mean, they might be de democracies in name, but it, they don't really function as democracies, sadly. Mm. Well, I, 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 I might, in Israel too, is that the, the economic situation of Arabs in Israel exceeds that of Arabs in any other Arab country. Yes, yes. They're better off in every way, education, health, uh, ability, um, even the security of them in their own religious setting, whether they're Sunni or Shiite or whatever um, branch of Islam they are, they are safer in the practice of their own religion and their own community organisations and everything in Israel than they would be, than some of them would be in surrounding Arab countries. Mm -hmm. Certainly better off economically. Mm -hmm. I should have... so, so go ahead. Go ahead. Now, culturally, who is the, um, which side has the dominance um, or the, the highest growth rate, population growth rate? I presume that would be the Arabs, would it? Ami, do you have an idea on who has a population growth? Is it the Arabs or the Israelis? Well, the, the, there is the religion uh, side uh, yeah. in Israel, the Jewish, which of course, who, who of course. brings lots of children. It's like a, a blessing. Yes. And it's also sometimes subsidized by yes. the country, the government. Yes. Like from fifth um, child onwards, you get money. Uh, yes. So, yes. But, but there is a solution that was heard about two countries in Israel, two countries for two nations. Mm -hmm. So th there are options, there are poss possibilities. Mm. Yes. I should have mentioned one other people group that I didn't really mention was the Druze. They're a minority group, but they certainly, uh, you'd say, I think they're from Midianite descent. So uh, they're not directly from Ishmael or from um, Itzhak, but they come from um, one of the other Abraham's wives, and they certainly get on reasonably well living in Israel. They don't have any problem. Many of them serve in the uh, army, as indeed some do, some Arabs, but uh, they certainly get on quite well. 
Well, I understood the Druze were genuine Arabs, the same no, as any other no, Arab. No, 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 I believe oh, they, they, they worship, well, they, their prophet is Jethro, uh, the father-in-law to Moses, and I think, therefore, they relate that through, because remember, father, uh, uh, Moses had fled to Midian, uh, married his uh, daughter, Jethro, and I think they do have a Midianite um, uh, background. Okay. That's, that's a curious geographic shift because Midian was in what is now Saudi Arabia. Yes. But, but isn't the Druze heartland sort of around the Lebanese border? Yeah. And probably, in- probably is. Probably is, yes. But they may be one of the other people groups that moved in there during, the, I guess, the medieval times and the times when after Arab conquest, and uh, look, I, I don't, the answer is I don't know. But I do know that their prophet is Jethro. Uh, Stephen, can I just say thank you for an amazing yes. um, overview of the situation there. We'll have to look at it again on the bigger screen, I think, and okay. take more notes to study it. I suppose I'm more left-wing. I'm certainly not a conservative. Yes. Um, and I would just love to see Palestinians return to their homelands in Israel. Yes. I'd like to see them uh, be involved in the democratic process of Israel. Sure. Um, we were there too a long time ago, but we noticed how well the um, Palestinians lived, the Arabs lived in Israel. Yes. I think that's a good thing. I mean... Yes. You know, they don't seem as if they're persecuted. And I think, um, you know, that both sides are intelligent enough to get through this yes. if they didn't have these factions on the far right yes. um, and perhaps on the far left. You know, we're creating um, a never-ending problems with no I, I have to say, if I may, that I find it quite interesting that the Arab nations insist that the uh, Palestinian refugees have to stay in their camps largely. I'm, I'm, look, I'm making, I'm generalising here, and must not assimilate. And yet we've seen just the last few years Syrian refugees fleeing the war in Syria between the two brands of Islam are quite happy and quite free not to stay, in, but to go either to Europe or, or wherever. It mm. seems that the Palestinians... In a, as a particular group of Arabs, are not allowed to have any other course but to go back to their land, whereas Syrians can. Uh, it seems to me a particular point. And look, I think we all acknowledge it is all about Jerusalem largely. It's about the Temple Mount. It's about the third most, most holy shrine in Islam and the most holy shrine in Judaism. Uh, if they should in any way relinquish that, then it is a, it is a uh, it's a betrayal of what they believe. I think that's to me anyway. That's that's the real answer because that's where the riots on the sec on that second intifada started um, when uh, there was a rumor. In fact, back to Hebron back in nineteen was it nineteen twenty eight? I think it was. Many were killed when there was a rumor and only a rumor that the Jews were going to seize the Temple Mount. It's the one thing that uh, provokes anger. Big anger. Mm. But in I addition to the anger, sorry, sorry go on. I, I just, I thought when we were there that both sides recognised each other's um, legitimacy yes. in that religious mount, you know, um, wailing wall, etc. I mean, it's just something that could be worked out. The other thing is Hamas. Yes. When they're replaced, and that that will surely come. There might be a chance of more negotiation then. You're right. The PLO, well, you saw the PLO did moderate. They, they recognised the right of Israel, to, and they hadn't between 1948 and 1988, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Up till then, they would not even, in fact, in 67, I believe it is correct, and Ami might correct me on this, Israel, once they captured the West Bank, said, we'll go back to it as long as you'll negotiate. The PLO wouldn't even sit down at the table. We do not even recognise you to even talk to and in fact, there is a saying, and I heard it repeated a number of times, uh, the Palestinians never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. There was always <laughs> some final 
extra thing they wanted that they, was unachievable. Look, if I may, and I will give you, June, in fact, there is a guy here, I'm just going to hold him up, um, Craig Nelson, lives in Adelaide. He came to our meeting when we pre-COVID, when we were actually at Table College, and he, of course, he does have a view that the Palestinians should be able to return to their Israel. He's an Adelaide guy, I think, because he certainly needed to be an Adelaide guy. So, yes, look, we do have that. And that's indeed why I finished with the last slide. This is something that is God's doing. It's not either Palestinians or it's not uh, the Arabs doing. It's got to be God's doing. And God said, you know, you, you've read the leak. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, my parting point. Thanks. Um, okay, to Eric. Um, at this stage, um, I'll finish uh, the recording. So um, um, I'm overwhelmed in terms of the amount of information that you presented and that you know. And um, I'm very grateful. I kind of uh, asked you to actually do this presentation. So um, it really in it educated me. And I hope it educated others. So thank you very so much for what you've done tonight. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Stephen. Stephen. Yeah. Signing off too. Yeah.